Thank you for listening to a Christ-centered message from Grace Community Church. We are committed to proclaiming the authority of God's Word without apology and trust that you will receive encouragement as we study today's passage together. Let's go in our Bibles, Philippians chapter 2. The title of today's message is Work It Out. Work it out. Anyone have exercise equipment that you have purchased at one time or another in your life and it collected dust? Raise your hand. Come on. You saw it. That was going to be the way you were going to get in shape for this time and now and forever. And there it sits or it went to the yard sale or to the curb and it didn't do what it was intended to do, right? You have to work it out, right? You have to work out on it. You have to use it or it doesn't do one bit of good. Now listen, uh, Disney Pixar made a killing on movies that were fixated on the idea of toys purchased and not played with. How awful is that, right? Toy Story. That if you bought a toy and it just stayed in the package for duration, anyone have some of those things, collector items, and they're still in the package because the value, and it just goes unused, untapped potential. That's not the point. Some people might even have collector cars, those antique automobiles, and they stay because I'm keeping low miles on that car. I don't want any miles on that car. So no one ever drives it. It just sits there, rusting, getting old, collecting dust. What's the point of that? When Paul comes out of, off this mountaintop of who Jesus is and what he has done for us, there's a point to it. He's going somewhere with this truth that will land in a response of worship, a response of surrender, a response of awe in the one who gave his all for me. This isn't just intellectual knowledge that we are just puffed up. We, we learn some more. We know some more. We have more knowledge. This is going somewhere, and that is what Paul is taking the Philippian church to. Consider a man who is starving, and he doesn't understand that right behind a closed door of a pantry is all the food that he needs. He just didn't open the door. He has the access to it, but he didn't work it out of the pantry. And so he starves inches away from what will keep him alive. Now, Christianity is not a philosophy, an idea that's behind a glass. Don't touch it. You know, just leave it there. Christianity is absolutely to be taken and lived out, like salt out of the shaker, light on a candle, in a candlestick, giving light to the whole room. That's what Jesus said to let our light shine. This gospel is truth to be set on display like a city on the hill. So what you and I believe will determine how we behave. And Paul wanted more than anything to relate the truth of the gospel to these Philippian believers so that their walk, their relationships would mirror the person and work of Jesus Christ. Loved ones, if we ever disconnect our salvation, our faith, the gospel from daily life, then what good is it? It ceases to have a point and then it misrepresents the gospel. A failure to properly apply the word of God to our lives, it leads to dysfunction, it leads to confusion, it leads to idolatry, it leads to self-centered living. Quite honestly, it leads to a mess. Unity abounds when the people of God are grounded in the word of God and apply that truth to their daily lives. This is a practical message. Philippians chapter 2, you follow along there, verse 12. Therefore, okay, we just came out of all of the study of this. How are we going to have unity in the church? Considering the example of Jesus, all he's done for us. Therefore, therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not not only as in my presence 
but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. This is the word of God. Do you have the desire to grow in grace this morning? You realize this is a community project that we grow in grace together? So what does it look for us look like for us to grow in grace together? Well, we will grow in grace together, and we're going to see four ways in these two verses that Paul lays out to apply this truth, this this mountain of the gospel truth to the lives of the Philippians and for us. Number one, we need to respond to truth with practical application. That our learning is for living. And so Paul says, therefore. Paul was a worshiper of Jesus, and so he was devoted to leading other people to worship Jesus. He believed, and it is true and it is right, that worship is always the right response to Jesus. So he uses the word therefore. Maybe your Bible says wherefore. And there's a, there's a Bible uh, rule, and that's whenever you see the word therefore, you always need to stop and see what it is there for. Okay, it's connecting something. So you can remember that. Been taught that for years. Okay, whenever you see the word therefore, stop and see why is it there? What is it there for? And you have to read the the context. What is in front of that? That's what we've been studying. I won't re-preach those messages this morning. They're all online. You You can get them on a podcast. You can get them on YouTube. They're everywhere, all right? But Paul is saying this, the truth that we have been given is for real life. So he makes here a powerful transition. He brings all the weight of what he wrote in the previous verses, to bear upon the people of God in Philippi. This letter is is the heart of a pastor. He's writing a sermon to these people. He loves them. Verses 1 through 4 of chapter 2, he says, remember the person and the passion of Jesus. Remember what he's done for you. Take inventory of that. In verses 5 through 11, remember the example and the exaltation of Jesus so when we read that, we meditate on that. The early church, that was, a, that was a hymn that they sang. So imagine the audacity of finishing the hymn that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You know, you offended me the other day. You should hear horror film music. Like, no! How can you be offended? The truth is for real life. So now his, in these verses, 12 down through 18, we're going to see practical ways if they say, well, Paul, how do we live this out? How do we respond? And he'll write, and we'll study that. What is our right response? Well, the truth is for real life. It's not just for knowledge. It's for life. The truth sets us free, loved ones, to worship. This is a right response, therefore. And worship, lest we be confused, worship is not the part of our service where we're singing. That's part of worshiping, but when we give, that's worship. You shovel snow, that's worship. Prepare coffee, that's worship. Changing diapers, thank the Lord for those who serve, that's worship, okay? Whatever we do for the glory of Christ, through Christ, that is done if we do it for his honor and glory and not for ours, that's worship. Somebody said hi to you today and welcomed you. Someone prayed with you. That's worship. It all goes together. What are we doing right now? This is worship. We're we're opened to the word of God. We're under the word of God. This truth sets us free to worship. So Christians, what are we? Sinners who've been saved by grace. We've repented of our sin. We've placed our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And now we've been made saints. Children of God, John 8, 32, and you will know the truth, and the truth will do what? Set you free. free. We were slaves to sin. I'm not a slave to sin anymore. We just sang that today. Not a slave to my sin any longer. Now, I wish I could tell you that I don't sin anymore, but I'm not a slave to sin. I'm a servant. I'm a slave to Christ, and he's a much better master. The truth about us, loved ones, is ugly. 
The Bible calls us sinners, Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every last one of us, we've missed the mark. It's the problem with the world. It's the problem within me. We've all committed treason. You know how many people don't buy? They, just, they see that scripture and they say, nah, I don't believe it. That's too cut and dry. We're all sinners. We've all committed treason against our creator. We have lied against him. We just looked at it this morning. That commandment number five, who here can say you not just obeyed your mom and dad your entire life, but you honored them? The person here that can say, oh yeah, that is me. I honored my mother and father from the cradle. And anyone who should raise their hand, would you dare? Everyone around would say, you're, now you can, lying nine, you broke nine, you're lying. Oh, there were times we maybe obeyed mom and dad, but in our heart, we are absolutely rejecting the command. I want to be God. I want to say what I want and have it happen. The truth about us is ugly, but the truth about Jesus is glorious. He is the one who's sinless. He honored his mother, his earthly adopted father, Joseph. His entire, he honored his father in heaven perfectly. So Romans 5, 8 says, but that God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, what did Christ do for us? He didn't wait for us to become better. He died for us while we were yet sinners. He is the one who changes us, saves us, redeems us. So how do we respond to this glorious truth about Jesus? Well, it can be said in this way, A-C-T-S, Acts, okay? Adoration. This is true for our worship. This is true for our prayer lives that we respond and what we have done together this morning corporately is we adore you, Lord. We worship you. We stand in awe of you. We are worshiping you, what Jesus said in John 4 and 23, that the Father is seeking such people to worship him. And what is the Father seeking? Jesus said, but the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. In spirit and in truth. So it's with everything in us according to truth. It's not just uh, getting carried away in emotions, but he told the woman, woman at the well, the Father is looking, the Father is seeking for worshipers, and they will worship him in spirit and in truth. That he's seeking after you. That you would become a worshiper. And then we respond in confession, adoration, confession, and that's what it was even prayed this morning. We're sinful, and you are a Savior, and we confess you as Lord, and we confess we own our sin to you, and that leads to a response of thanksgiving. Thank you, Lord, for what you have done. Thank you for how you've delivered. Thank you that you sent your one and only Son for me. There's a thankfulness here, and then we move forward from that in submission that we're submitted to Christ, that we bring all of our doubts, we bring all of our needs, we bring all of our requests, our failures, our sin, our shame to Jesus, and we confess and we forsake all rebellion, and we live submitted to him. This is what it is to respond to truth with practical application. That's what we spend time doing in our small groups, is how do we apply what we've learned how do we put it into practice? How can we pray for one another? How can we bear one another's burdens and so apply the truth practically in our lives? Are you with me? Number two, if we're gonna grow in grace together, then we need to relate to others through tender expression. Relate to others through tender expression. Paul has something difficult that he's going to mention to them, but he does it in a loving way. Therefore, my beloved. You can't get more tender than that. Paul is overflowing here with grace as he addresses these Philippians. He's relating to them in a tender way. So what he has to say is very tough. It's very difficult. Do you like to hear it when someone says, hey, I just want you to know you're wrong? Oh, thank you so much. God bless you. Thank you. 
But what if they're right? And they risk everything to tell you you're wrong. Then you look back and you say, I see you loved me enough to just not say, ah, oh, bon voyage, bridge is out. No, Paul here has a personal connection with them. And this is important for us to learn if we're going to grow in grace. If we're going to relate to others through tender expressions, there has to be this personal connection that we're united together in Christ. And so we have been made one. But loved ones, this doesn't eliminate all conflict. You know, aren't, don't you think all Christians would just get along so wonderfully? And that Christian marriages would be like, oh, I'm married to you and I am married to thee. This is amazing, you know, and this is wonderful and this is bliss. Yeah, marriage is tough. But it's worth the investment. It's worth the work. Parenting. Being together in a church family. Yeah, well, well, sometimes we have to, you know, wait on people who run late or whatever else it may be. And love abides. This is a personal connection. Paul met all these people when he visited Philippi in Acts 16. And how was this church brought to life? Through persecution. He proclaimed the gospel. They beat him and Silas. They threw him into prison. That night, there they are, Acts 16, in jail, and they're singing and praising God at midnight. Earthquake happens, and all prisoners are immediately set free, but they stay. Philippian jailer comes in. He thinks, they're going to kill me because I'm for sure believing all these prisoners are gone. And Paul says, wait, 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 wait. Don't do yourself any harm. Nobody left. We're all here. And what is the follow-up question the Philippian jailer gives to him? He falls down on his knees. Who's in charge of the prison now? The Lord. And says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Well, why is he thinking about that? What do you think Paul was talking to him about when he was locking him in the innermost, deepest part of the prison that night? It is until the next morning that the man finds out when the magistrates say, Psst, you can let him go. And Paul says, no, I'm not going anywhere. You tell the magistrates, come on over here because they imprisoned a Roman citizen. They broke the law. And what he did wasn't self. The Philippian jailer didn't even know that until that morning. And then Paul set in order and in motion a place of protection for these people. These are my people, and I'm not just going to run out of town. I'm going to stay here, and I'm going to set an order of protection that God has done this, that God is more sovereign and more powerful than em the emperor Caesar. So you tell them to come over here, and if they want me to go, they can open the door for me. Think about that. He's personally connected to these. And this church is now comprised in Philippi. You got the Philippian jailer. You got the slave girl that was set free from her de demonic possession. You've got Lydia, the seller of purple. You've got all of these different people, and they're all in this body. They're not from the same background, not from the same experiences, and now they're part of the same family. How are they going to work all these things out? They're going to stir up love and good works like it says in Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10, 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. Okay, that's truth. Hold fast to that, for he who promised is faithful. Thank the Lord for that. Okay, he's faithful. Verse 24, and then this truth moves is somewhere. It's the same thing we're seeing in Philippians 2. And let us, all right, people of God, let us consider how to stir up one another. Oh, some of you are good at that, right? Oh, I can stir it up. Yeah, well, what? stir up what? Stir up one another to love and good works. Stir one another up to love and good works. Verse 25, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Why we come together on a Friday night to worship? Because we want to stir one another up to love and good works. We want to come together and just be together for an evening and worship the Lord together and encourage one another and pray together and scripture and sing. He also has a biblical conviction. Why do you believe what you believe? So by God's grace, church family, we will not be disagreeable 
over preferences and opinions, but by God's grace, we will hold firmly to what is biblical and true. And we will not let go of that. Uh, that that's coming even in this chapter. We'll see it in a couple weeks. Philippians 2.16, just, just down. Um, where he says, holding fast to the word of life. Like, grip it tightly to the word of life, to the, to the gospel. And then there's an enduring compassion. If we're going to relate to others through tender expression, there has to be an enduring compassion. And this is a concern for someone else's well-being. This isn't trying to get control over their lives. It's not about preferences. It's not about trying to own someone else's conscience. It's a compassion for them. So Paul chose to address them graciously and tenderly as he is going to deal with unresolved conflict that was brewing there in the church. Just, just again, we've looked at it a few times because he's going somewhere and it seems, you know, it's not until chapter four and it doesn't seem like it has much weight in this whole letter, but it absolutely has the power to split the church at Philippi to ruin the testimony of the church at Philippi for the entire Philippian community. And in Philippians 4 and verse 2, he's going to say, I entreat Yodia and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellows work, fellow workers whose names are in, written in the book of life. So there are there's some ladies that are not, they're, they're not getting along. And Paul loves them enough that he is compassionate toward them, that he's going to reach out and he's saying, we have to deal with this. We can't just, well, I'm sure they'll work it out. Well, everybody's entitled to their own opinion. Well, I'm, I'm sorry you feel that way. No, he's going to have to press into this. And he's saying, hey, my... You know, the minister there and the others come alongside of these individuals and help them work it out. See the title of the message? It's really what the whole point of Philippians is. If there's going to be joy, if there's going to be peace, then there are going to be th some things that we're going to have to work it out. And not just sweep it under the rug and not just think it'll all go away, but actually address it. And addressing conflict in a healthy manner that's one of the most difficult areas of relationships, isn't it? Isn't that hard? So Paul chose to follow the example of the Lord Jesus and truly love others like he wrote in 1 Corinthians 13. He was a genuine peacemaker. He demonstrated his humility and his growth even when he later on commended John Mark and found him to be useful. Okay, John Mark, in, in, if you don't know, in the missionary journey, John Mark went out with Paul and Barnabas and they went out on the mission. There's John Mark in the book of Acts. And then John Mark quit. Later, John Mark says, hey, you know what? I, I wanna get back with you guys. I wanna go with you on the next trip. And Paul says, no, no. Barnabas says, come on, Paul, let's take him. Paul says, Barnabas, he ain't going with me. This is a complete paraphrase, okay? He's not going with me. He quit last time. And Barnabas says, I think he should go. Paul says, no, over my dead body. He's not going. I'm not taking quitters out to the front lines. And so they split with a sharp contention, Luke writes in Acts. And Barnabas went on out. He went with John Mark. And Paul went a different way and took Timothy and took Sots. He went with others, but later on in life, Paul was humble enough to say, hey, and will you send John Mark to me for he's useful to me, 2 Timothy 4.11. That's a humble man. That's a man who confronted and was willing to say, hey, you know when I made that call way back there? God be glorified. I, I, I may not have been right, and I praise God he's back. He's back in the game. Take him off the bench and put him in. That's a humble man of God. If we're going to work it out, then, loved ones, we can't be peace fakers, 
okay? We can't be peace fakers. Ignore the conflict, bury our head in the sand, hope somebody else deals with it, it'll just all go away. We cannot be peace breakers. There are some people like, oh, I just tell it like it is. They love to blow it up, right? They'll blow it up in the break room. They'll blow it up in the family, you know, Thanksgiving get together. They don't care. They like to take a topic, pull the pin and throw it in. And here goes uncle whoever and sit back and watch it all fly. Peace breakers. Well, that's not Christian. We're called to be, by Jesus, peacemakers. And Paul is giving us a master class on what it is to be a peacemaker. He's showing us, therefore, my beloved. This is what we're called to do in Matthew 18 in the process of church discipline. How can we, how can I help bring shalom, peace to a situation where everything is in its right place? That's true in a family, that's true in a church, that's true in our community, okay? How can we shine the light of the gospel rightly? Paul writes to the Galatians chapter six and verse one, he says, brothers, a term of endearment. If anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a a spirit of gentleness. The idea there that that restore, it has to do with resetting a broken bone. It's painful, but it has to be done. It should be done gently, but firmly. Restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, okay? There's a lot of people that love to go hold everybody else accountable and go after people, and you're wrong, and you're wrong, and you're wrong, and what are they missing? Keep watch on you, the person you see in the mirror. Oh, we have to be careful because easily we can be just they didn't and they don't and they failed and they don't. And we can, we can miss this. And we can pretend like I keep all the law. I'm perfect. They messed up. No, that's only Jesus. Keep watch on yourself lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, Paul says, and so fulfill, all right, live out the law of Christ. Show the law of Christ. Put it on display. That's what Paul is doing here. And that brings us to number three. To grow in grace together, we need to address disobedience by direct admonition. It's just be direct. And he says this in verse 12, as you have always obeyed. So he's still continuing this kind, this connection with them, this expression of kindness. You see how he he affirms them. That you've always, it's not that, You guys are never obedient. You never listen. You're always losers. I can't believe you know what I went through and you remember my back and you remember. He's not doing that to them. He says, I I see obedience in you. You have a history of obeying. So now, not only is in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Paul was driven by love as he addressed this problem here in the in the church at Philippi, this problem of division, this problem of uh, a lack of forgiveness. But do you know what she did to me? Yeah, well, you, and back and forth it goes until somebody breaks that cycle. So he addresses the disobedience directly. We live to praise God for his salvation. So when Paul addresses this, he's going back to, do you understand how you came to faith? You obeyed the gospel. That obedience was there when we went to the riverside, when that slave girl came in, the Philippian jailer. I've seen obedience from the beginning of this church. We live to praise God for his salvation. He's going right back to what we just finished in Philippians 2, 5 through 11. You heard that message and you responded. This was a conversion that took place and it happens when a sinner repents and submits. They come under, they hear under the truth of the gospel. This is when God works the gospel into a sinner's heart and life and that's what Paul is saying. I've heard, I've seen your obedience. And that word obedience, we get the word acoustics from that, what you hear. 
And, and then there's the, the under, you hear under, you, you came under the word, all right? So sometimes there'll be multiple people, everybody's talking, talking, and then you have a competition on who's going to be heard. You ever sat across from a table like that where everybody's talking and you're like, who's, who's listening to anybody? And like, everybody's just like talking, like, I'm not sure who's listening to them or them. And they don't even know no one's listening. They're just all talking. Like, you know, like they're a bunch of kids and like, ah, just talking. If you're going to hear, it means you have to, you have to submit you under what's being said. And that's what he's saying, your obedience to the faith. When their hearts were opened by God, you remember that about Lydia? Her heart was opened the Lord did that. He's sovereign in salvation. Acts uh, chapter 6 and verse 7, and the word of God continued to increase. And the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. They submitted to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, the people that you would think would never come to faith in Christ. So to claim to be a follower of Jesus Christ, but then to live in disobedience to the word of God is inconsistent at best, and it's blasphemous at its worst. The Lord does not delight, delight in outward religious activity that's disconnected from inward authenticity. He, he's not impressed if we are living to impress other people. Look at what I do. Look at, look at me. Look at me. That's not impressive to the Lord. Samuel had to learn that. Well, he brought that lesson to King Saul in the Old Testament. First Samuel 15 and 22. King Saul was full of himself and didn't want to wait. He said, I'm the king. I'll offer the sacrifice myself. And Samuel said this, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices? as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Saul disobeyed the command that the Lord had given to him. And then he tried to justify it. Oh, no, no, we saved all the sheep. We saved all the things because we're going to offer a sacrifice to the Lord, Samuel. You know, it's okay. I've justified my disobedience. But this is what the word of the Lord is. Behold, don't miss this. To obey is better than what? Sacrifice. Sacrifice. and to listen than the fat of rams. To obey is better than sacrifice. Yeah, but I, but I gave this much to the, the thing, and I help these people, and I do all of these things. Are, are you hearing and responding in obedience to the Lord? Countless world religions are filled with worshipers who worship a God of their own making, their own design. It's according to their own needs, desires, thoughts. It's idolatry. We must all do what Paul is talking about, come to the saving knowledge of the truth. Listen to what Paul said to the Thessalonians about their report of how they came to faith in Christ. 1 Thessalonians 1.9. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you and how you, this is what salvation is, how you turn to God from idols. That's repentance. I serve, this is what it looks like. I lived for myself. I lived for whatever it is that's not God. Entertainment, immorality, my own thinking, religion, doing good deeds. You turned to God from idols. None of that can save you. Well, I, I was baptized, I made a profession, I, I give, I serve, I do all these things. That can't save you. It will not bear up the weight of your soul. You turned to God from idols, you can't join them together. So in, in India, where the Shahs labor, they would be readily accepted by the entire continent of India if they said, just please add Jesus to your 330 million gods. Okay. 330 million and Jesus. But the message isn't add Jesus to your idolatry. The message for all nations, for all peoples is you have to turn from your history, what you've been taught, how you've been brought up, your culture. It won't save you. You have to turn to God from idols and do what then? And to wait for his son from heaven 
whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. That's the power of the gospel, and that's what people hate. I was just listening to a testimony last night of someone who was brought up in the church, taken to all kinds of youth events, liked what he heard about Jesus, and he walked away from it. A very public, national figure. He said, I just can't buy into it. And he disdained this very gospel. So Paul writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 2, he says, First of all then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. What is this truth? What is this gospel? Verse five, for there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Well, what did he do, Paul? He gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. We live to praise God for his salvation. And so Paul is connecting your salvation. It it will be worked out. If you truly belong to the Lord, then you're going to have a concern for everybody, kings, people who are in a position of authority, your neighbors, your community, all nations, people that don't look like you, don't speak your same language. You're going to care about them that they hear and they come to the knowledge of the truth. We live to praise God for his salvation, but then we live also to please God through our sanctification. Our sanctification, that is to be made holy. It is to be set apart. It's this ongoing process in our lives that saints live out the gospel. They are working it out. How many of you enjoy math? I am not a person who loves math, all right? I'll sweat and stew and get confused and just math is just not my thing. And there are some people that math is just alive to them and they can, you know, people like that and numbers just go together and they can just function in numbers like, yes, bring on more problems. That is not me. Okay, so the idea is working out the problem. Like it takes work. You got to work it out. Show your answer. How did you get the answer? Show how you worked it out. That's what sanctification is in our lives. You have been saved and you are being saved and it's a process of working it out. Work out the gospel. Live out the potential of the gospel. Our lives are radically transformed by the gospel. And so Paul is saying to them, don't wait to obey until I get there. Who are you trying to please? Me? I didn't die for you. If you're living to the praise and the honor and glory of Jesus, then get started on this now. We live to please God through our sanctification. It could be said this way. If someone gave to you a gold mine, you know, reading of the will, someone passed away, hey, there's a plot in the hills of Montana, and they're, they're to you. It's a, there's a gold mine there, it's yours. Well, how much wealth do you have? How much ever's in the hill? But what are you going to have to do? you got to get it out of the hill. It's yours. They gave it to you. But it doesn't do you any good as long as it's down in the mountain. You have to go get it out of the mountain. You have to mine it out of the mountain. You have to work it out of the mountain. Understand what Paul is saying. Do you realize what God has done for you in Christ? Now work out all of that potential. Work it all out. And it is God who works in us doing this work this out in our family, in our relationships, our church family, our co-workers, our community, that we serve the Lord. And he says this in such a way with fear. We remember that God crushed his son because of my sin. Think about this now. That God crushed his son for our sin, and there are people that think that they'll, but he'll let them off the hook. My sin's not that big of a deal. But he crushed his son, and you he'll let slide. I don't think so. 
Why would I ever think then that I can ignore my sin, belittle my sin, excuse my sin, or get away with my sin? That's unthinkable. Hebrews 12, 28, let us, or therefore let us, be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer God, to God, acceptable worship with reverence and awe. It's always connected to that. Why? For our God is a consuming fire. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For our sake, read it with me. He made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. He crushed him in my place so that he treated Jesus the way I deserve to be treated so that he can treat me the way Jesus deserves to be treated. Wow, this is love. So serve the Lord in remembrance and serve the Lord in reverence, he says, with fear and trembling. (laughs) This is a life lived in humility. You see, we're not saved by our works, but we're saved for good works. And there's there's a life that is lived then in humility and in awe and in reverence for the one who gave his life for me and for you. It's grace. We're immediately aware of our own inadequacy to live in a way that pleases the Lord. How do I do this? How do I work this out with fear and trembling? This is, this is heavy as it sits down upon us. I have to live in a way that rightly reflects the glory of God in Christ. So Paul would write to the Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8. He says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Now are we saying, Paul, are you confused here? You just wrote to the Philippians, work out your own salvation, but you're writing to the Ephesian people that it is God who saves you. It's a gift. It's not your own doing. Is this a conflict? A contradiction? Verse 9, Ephesians 2, that our salvation is not a result of works so that no one may boast. Huh. Huh. So I'm not saved by my good works, but then verse 10 is what puts it all together. We are saved. It's all about your prepositions. We are saved for good works, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. Why? For working out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So who's doing this, God or us? Well, God does what we cannot do. He saves us. He adopts us. He redeems us. And then Paul is saying what true Christianity is, live out in light of what has been done for you. If a child is adopted into a family, they're they're serving in the family, helping in the family, whatever it is, you know, chores around the house that isn't related to them, uh, we'll keep you in the family, we'll adopt you. You are part of the family, so because you're part of the family, you have our name, Here is what your role is in this family. Live out the reality you've been adopted. That's what this is. Well, this is heavy. This is a lot. So number four, if we're going to grow in grace, then we're going to need to rely on the Lord for divine intervention. The supernatural ability that we don't have, none of us. We're crying out, help. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Like we're lacking on the team here. All right, let's bring God in. Okay, we're good. Right? It is God who works in you. Paul would would say, you know, who is sufficient for these things? This is crushing me. And later on to the Corinthians, he says, our sufficiency is from God. He supplies what we lack. The power for genuine life change, it comes from the Lord. From time to time, you will have in your family or in the friendships that you have or you see on even TV, from time to time, there are are shows or documentaries where someone is so overwhelmed with addiction that they cannot get out of that pit by themselves. 
And so their family who love them, they, they, they step in with help and they do what's called an intervention. This person, we love them and we will risk them saying horrible things about us. We'll risk them hating us, blasting us, physically going against us because we love them and we love them so much we cannot leave them alone and we will engage. They need an intervention. That's all of us. Cannot save myself. I can't work out my own salvation by myself. And that's why Paul says, for it is God who works in you. It's God who's at work in you. We have his spirit, we have his word, and we have his community. Listen to what John Calvin says about this. It is God who works in you. Uh, He says this, he says, this is the true engine for bringing down all haughtiness. This is the sword for putting an end to all pride when we are taught that we are utterly nothing and can do nothing except through the grace of God alone. And when we all say, amen, so be it, that's true, then guess who gets the praise? The one who's worthy. The Lord does. Believer, listen now, God is always working for your good. He's always working for your good. It is God who works in you. So look in every situation, in every season, look how the hand of God is orchestrating blessings and burdens to cause you to love him and trust him more each day. It's not just the blessings. Because if we're honest, often in the blessings, we forget God. And we become entitled like he owes us blessings. His love abides, and his love is perfecting us. It's transforming us into the image of his son. And so I have to give that condition there. It's to the believer. That promise is not universal to everybody. Salvation and the message, the gospel, is available to everyone. And if you repent of your sin and you come to faith in Christ, then you can take this promise as this is for me now. Not because of me, but because of Jesus. So believer, God is always working for your good. Well, can you prove that? Romans 8, 28 does. And we know that for those who love God, can I ask you that? Do you love God? That's what Christians are known by, the people who love God. All things work together for good to those who are called according to his purpose. And loved ones, his love will always do what is best for us. And often we will not understand, I can almost say, Almost always we will not understand all that he is doing, this process in our lives on this side of eternity, but we hold to the truth. We preach the gospel to our own hearts and we encourage one another, trust in the Lord, hold tightly to him. Trust in the Lord, hold tightly to him. Believer, God is working all things for his glory. For our good and for his glory. That's what Paul says, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. This will, this intent, this desire that God is sovereign over that. And yes, his will is sovereign, but he's changing my will. So it's God who works and the things that I used to love, I don't love anymore. Have you experienced that? The things that you used to find important and suddenly he's given you the eternal and those are more important. And I used to be all consumed with this, that, or the other. And the Lord is, he's moving that. He's he's changing my perspective. It's God who does that. He changes our will. He's sovereign. He'll finish the work he started in us, Philippians 1, 6 says. Listen to how John Philip says this. He said, the Holy Spirit plants in the believer's heart the desire and the determination to bring pleasure to God. Before you come to faith in Christ, that's not what you want. You want the applause. You want the security. You want the safety, the health, the wealth, the happiness. And after that, you come to faith in Christ and you realize, if I have him, I have everything. That changes your perspective. It's completely changed. We're not grab, you know, grasping for here and now and temporary anything because we have what is eternal, to will and to work, that God then provides the energy, the power to accomplish what is will, that I have a desire to please him, and he enables me by his spirit to actually live to the honor and glory of God. He alone has the power to change our desires in every other aspect of our lives. 
He is sovereign and we are responsible. Galatians 2.20, Paul says it a little different way, but it's almost the same as what he's writing here. I have been crucified with Christ. Oh, he's dead? Yeah, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I thought you were dead. I'm alive. I'm now alive in Christ. He lives in me and the life I now... It's, it's the same thing we're studying here in Philippians 2, 12 and 13, and it's all going somewhere for his good pleasure. His good pleasure. He's holy, and he will see to it that we, child of God, that we are conformed to the image of his dear son. So we have this hope because he's given us this hope, and we will purify our lives because he is pure to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. That is why you are breathing his air right now. And for every minute that he gives to you, it's that you might know him and glorify him and enjoy him. Stephen Lawson says it this way. He says, as a father seeks to encourage, exhort, and discipline his children to live by the standards of his family, so God nurtures that which conforms to his own nature. It brings a great pleasure to God to see his people grow in their personal holiness. It delights God to see his image restored in his people. That's what God is doing. That Genesis 3, we fell, and in Christ, he is restoring his image in his people. And so the psalmist says it this way in Psalm 1611. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence is the fullness of joy. At your right hand are what? Pleasures for how long? Evermore, never-ending pleasure and the greatest, fullest joy. What in this world can give you that? Nothing. It's all temporary and passing. And the psalmist is saying, well, who can have this? Anyone who comes to the Lord through Jesus Christ. Repentance and faith. That's the best place for you, and that's the best place for me. That's the best place for us. And this message is what all people need. They're cir- searching for love, they're searching for joy, they're searching for pleasure, they're searching. It's all temporary. So, how are we going to grow in grace together? Can we turn this into a prayer? Lord, help us to respond to this truth and all truth by practically applying it to our lives. Lord, will you help me to relate to others in a way that is tender? Lord, would you help me to address disobedience, but start here, (laughs) inside, in me first, by directly dealing with that? And Lord, we will rely on you because without you, we can't do it. But with you, he will do that work in us all for the glory and praise of Christ. So what is our next step? Have you received Christ as Savior? If not, that's where you begin. Lord, forgive me. I trust in Jesus. He'll receive you. Step two, we're gonna, in a few moments, someone who's been in faith a long time and the word of a pastor in another church I say it all the time, you know. I don't care. Wherever you hear the word, obey the Lord. Even if it's in Florida, that's fine. Respond to the word of the Lord. Are you living in obedience to the Lord? Step one, trust him. First step of obedience is baptism. And then the the next steps are till till he returns or we die. The rest of our life, just obeying, growing in grace. Let's stand together. Father in heaven, it is so good for us to be here. We long to grow in grace. So will you help us? Will you help us to love you and love others in such a way that we are good for others, that we are 
helpful to others, that we are encouraging to others. Let that start in our own hearts and lives, and let that be true in our families, in our marriages, in our homes, and let that be true in our friendship groups and where we work and in this church and in our community. Father, will you use us for your glory? Mold us and make us after the image of your dear son, we pray. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Thank you again for listening to Teaching from the Word at Grace Community Church. We are located in Richmond, Michigan. You can find us online at mygracechurch.com. Please subscribe and follow us at My Grace Church. It would be greatly appreciated if you would take a moment to rate, like, and share this message. We want you to always remember that you are loved.